Hi, my name is Nika, and I'm a student at NYU Poly. I'm working with the Microparticle Photophysics Lab, investigating Whispering Gallery Mode biosensors. Don't worry about the fancy names. We're going to start with the basics to explain how we use light to save lives. So, what is light? When you think of light, you might think of sunlight. Sunlight is what we call white light, and is actually made up of many different types of light, including visible light, ultraviolet light, and infrared light. You can see that when you send white light through a glass prism. Light is actually a small part of the electromagnetic spectrum, which actually includes many other types of waves, like x-rays and microwaves. In a laboratory, we don't usually want the broad band of waves that make up visible light, we only want one specific wavelength. To do this, rather than use a source of white light, we use a laser. But what exactly is a laser? Lasers might make you think of Star Wars or Star Trek or a secure bank vault, but those applications aren't important to us. Lasers are used in the laboratory because their light can be adjusted to a specific wavelength. Our goal is to use properties of light to detect viruses like HIV and even protein in human blood, and to do it faster and more accurately than current blood tests. We use what we call a tunable laser, which can change the wavelength of the light being emitted. The laser sends light down a thin piece of glass called an optical fiber to a detector on the other end of the fiber. The detector can record the intensity of the light sent through the fiber. A graph of what we have so far would look like this. However, when we bring a small glass sphere in contact with the fiber, at a certain wavelength the light stops going through the fiber and starts to orbit inside the sphere. On the graph, we see this as a dip in transmission intensity. Note that this only occurs at a specific wavelength, called the resonance wavelength. The way we detect a virus is by recording a difference in the resonant wavelength when a virus particle sticks to the surface of the sphere. The virus effectively changes the properties of the sphere, and thus the wavelength it resonates at. We can easily see a shift in the graph. When you look at the graph, you can see that we need a reasonably large shift in the resonant wavelength to be able to distinguish the new curve from the original data. This introduces a limit of detection. If the particle on the surface is much smaller, it doesn't change the resonant wavelength as much, and the difference is difficult to see. At a certain point, the data overlaps too much to be useful. To detect smaller things, like protein, we have to define a way to increase sensitivity. A glass sphere is just one type of resonator. Lots of things resonate. A common example is musical instruments, which can actually be represented by the same graph as a sphere. When you blow into a glass bottle with some liquid in it, it resonates and creates a musical note. The amount of liquid in the bottle changes the resonant wavelength of the bottle the same way the addition of a protein particle changes the sphere's resonant wavelength. The resonator we use to increase sensitivity is gold, because it's what we call plasmonic. This means that if you take a piece of gold, all the electrons, which are negatively charged, can oscillate and resonate, moving back and forth. The oscillation occurs because when the electrons move, they leave behind a positive charge that pulls them back. Similar to a pendulum swinging back and forth, the electrons have inertia that allows them to continue to swing from side to side of the gold. Without the gold enhancement, we have trouble detecting the protein. If a protein lands on a gold hotspot, the resonant wavelength changes so that we can more easily distinguish between the dips. The effect is actually due to the oscillating electrons enhancing the electric field around the sphere. For more details, you can check out the reference here. What we do is add a particle of gold to the equator of the sphere to create a double resonance. But if we look, the enhancement from the gold only affects our results if the protein lands right on the gold particle. To make sure that happens, we have to look at the biology of the protein we're trying to detect. A common protein is tryptavidin. That's the blue squiggly thing. It's not typically something you would test for in a blood test, but it's a good example to prove that our detection system can detect something small. Tryptavidin happens to bind very strongly to a molecule called biotin, the bubbly looking thing. Tryptavidin does not naturally bind to gold. It binds to biotin. We use gold particles attached to biotin called biotinylated gold, so that the streptavidin binds to the gold hotspots. A model of the idea looks like this. A glass sphere with biotinylated gold spots on it that streptavidin protein can bind to. Let's go back to the bigger picture. Overall, we're trying to take a glass sphere that resonates at a certain wavelength of light 
to stick to a protein so that we can detect a shift in the resonance. This shift is visible because we use gold hotspot resonance to enhance our sensitivity. With this system, we hope to achieve single protein detection. You might be wondering why we're so interested in protein detection and not just virus detection. When you get sick, your body responds by making lots and lots of antibodies to fight the infection. This means that there's always a higher concentration of antibody proteins than virus particles, as you can see in the picture. If we can detect protein, we can diagnose a virus before it spreads and multiplies. Another advantage is the fact that our system of detection is what we call label-free. It gets around a lot of the preparation steps of current methods like ELISA and has the potential for seeing just a single protein. This means that in the future, instead of waiting three weeks for your blood test results, you'll wait three minutes. Thank you for listening. This presentation was brought to you by the Microparticle Photophysics Laboratory of NYU Poly. For more information, visit mp3l.org. You can also check out our other YouTube videos, like Plasmonic Enhancement of WGM Microcavity.